Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is bear photography, around the world in eight bears. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Court Whalen. Court, it's so wonderful to have you here today. It's always a treat when you show up on the schedule. Um, let's dive in. Hey, thanks so much, Sonny. Yeah, a pleasure to be back in the mix on Daily Dose. And we're talking about a topic uh, that I really, really love. I'm, I've been looking forward to this one. Uh, it's a really unique way to present this because we're essentially taking eight really key critical wildlife photo lessons and exemplifying them with the eight bears of the world. So not only are you going to learn how to take killer bear photographs around the world, whether you're photographing polar bears or grizzlies, brown bears, or sun bears, as you can see on the title slide here, but you're gonna get some really honest to goodness, applicable wildlife photography lessons that you can use for anything of any size. It's not just bears. Um, so let's let's go ahead and dive right in. So uh, obviously we're, we're talking about this because bears are awesome, but they're also very, very diverse as photographic subjects. Uh, you have white bears on red tundra in some cases. You have black bears in green vegetation in some cases. Uh, you have bears doing all sorts of weird, crazy antics like this Bornean sun bear munching on some, some sugar cane here in Borneo. And you have just a plethora of photographic opportunities. It's not just capturing the behaviors or capturing rare spectacles, but you can truly make uh, quite fine art out of the, the photographs that you have with bears. They're charismatic megafauna, as, as a, a good buddy of mine says. So let's, let's dive right into it. But first, I want to go into just a smidgen of the biology to get you kind of on track with what we're talking about here. Uh, there are eight bear species of the world. Um, we're looking at a, a cladogram, as we call it, in the biology world. And this is really just to illustrate a couple of key points. Yes, pandas are actually a bear. There was sort of um, a little bit of debate back in the day of like, are they a true bear? Yes, they're a true bear. They are in today's presentation. Um, raccoons and lesser pandas, not bears. I don't know if I needed to tell you that, but nevertheless, it's on here. They're very closely related though. They have uh, ancestral origins. So that's why we, we do call it a panda, the red panda, but it's not a bear. It's not me in today's topic. Um, but like I said, you can use these lessons to photograph just about anything, so you can you can make that up too. But yeah, we're talking about the brown bear, also known as the grizzly bear. You don't see the grizzly bear on here because the brown bear and the grizzly bear are the same thing. Brown bear is uh, a grizzly bear that lives in the coast and feeds on nutrient-rich salmon. Grizzly bear is uh, the same thing but lives inland and usually feeds predominantly on sedges, berries, protein as well, but doesn't have that big diet, so it doesn't get as big. Uh, polar bear, Asiatic black bear, sometimes known as the moon bear, the American black bear, uh, the sun bear, often known as the Bornean sun bear or Malaysian sun bear. There are some subspecies involved. Sloth bear is usually the one when I when I quiz my guests what the eight species are that usually they don't get that one. That's a, that's a tricky one. That's Baloo from Jungle Book uh, found in India. And then the spectacled bear or the Andean bear, Andean spectacled bear is uh, that one that also trips people up. And then the panda, the giant panda is pretty iconic bear species that we all know and love. So these are the ones we're talking about today. But as with all my photo presentations, let's talk about the gear you need or the gear you want for bear photography of the world. We're gonna start with the cameras. Um, you can go for kind of your, your basic point and shoot. My, I love Canon power shots. I think they're up to the HX 70 now. It's big old mega zoom. Um, smartphones are pretty good. I've got to say smartphones are not going to be your greatest friend for bear photography necessarily, but a lot of the tips and tricks will, will, uh, be useful for smartphones, but you're really going to want some telephoto power, some zoom power. And that's the one thing smartphones have yet to do super great um, so far. I think the Google Pixel actually is up to some pretty good telephoto zoom. But you'll see my, my top two choices for cameras on the right side there. Um, the Sony RX10 is what we call a bridge camera. It's really in a class of its own. It does not interchange lenses. It's an all-in-one system, um, but it has a really big sensor and it's really comparable to the bigger, fancier cameras but it has something like a 24 to 600 millimeter zoom 
at F4 throughout. If those numbers don't make a lot of sense to you, just know it's a really, really great camera. Um, I've shot alongside people with that camera, my bigger, fancier camera, and the photos are really, really similar. So if you don't like to change lenses or don't want to change lenses, a really great one to get into. And if you've seen a lot of my past photo presentations, you'll know that my top right camera here is the one that I shoot on, the Canon R5. Um, I have switched around. Uh, I used to say DSLR or mirrorless. Now I say mirrorless or DSLR because mirrorless has really taken the world by storm. And, and I, I do think if you're in the market for a new camera, go for mirrorless, DSLR, the digital single lens reflex, those are kind of becoming the thing of the past. Um, the mirrorless has so many advantages. We can talk about that at the end with Q&A if you have more questions. But yeah, mirrorless, um, that's the tip top way to go. And with that kind of camera body, you wanna think about lenses. Um, I'm gonna give you four kind of big categories here. Um, starting with, I'm gonna go right to left actually. So a lot of people like to have the everything lens, right? You, you don't wanna change lenses. You want something that shoots wide for bears in landscapes. You want something that zooms in so you, you can get some, some telephoto power. And a lot of the big camera manufacturers will have something that has a huge range, like a 28 to 300, an 18 to 400 Tamron has. They're really helpful and really useful. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here, but just know that it, it is always hard to completely have your cake and eat it too. Um, usually when you, when you get a more narrow range or it's specifically mostly telephoto, you're going to get better quality, a better price, better versatility. Nevertheless, a big all-in-one zoom telephoto lens is nice. Um, then I'm actually going to skip the 70 to 200 for a second. I'm going to go to the 100 or 400 has been kind of the, the classic class of lens to photograph bears with. Um, the reason I put the 100 to 500 now is that in the last several years, super telephotos, super zoom telephotos, meaning that they have a range, 100 to 400, 100 to 500. We're seeing 100 to 600s, 200 to 500s, like getting in that 500 and 600 range to me makes it uh, super sized, right? And they, they really do give you a lot more versatility. So I am shooting on a 100 to 500 now. Um, the 100 to 400 class, still great. The 70 to 200 class, or sorry, 70 to 300 class is a very venerable one. But as we're getting that more distance, we're seeing more photographers very happy with that added range. Now the 70 to 200 I put in here is very interesting. And you wouldn't think a 200 millimeter, which is a, akin to like, I don't know, maybe like a five times zoom. It's not much, but it is a really, really nice lens for bear photography for a couple of reasons. One, the, the quality of just in general of that lens is always tip top quality. Um, you may not need a ton of zoom and telephoto depending on the trip you're going on. We sit with brown bears in coastal Alaska where bears are mere feet away from you. So having a 7200 um, smaller, lighter, more versatile, faster to focus can be really nice. But the biggest thing here is that f2.8. If you can shoot at f2.8, what that enables is that extraordinary shallow depth of field, which is just awesome. So if I can get away with 200 millimeters as my extent of zoom and telephoto, uh, I'm going to choose this lens each and every time because it gives me that f2.8 and a beautiful blur in the background. It makes a really professional look. Now, um, some of you may be wondering, like, why didn't I put the big 300 millimeter 2.8 or 400 millimeter 2.8, this 5 and 600 f4s? Uh, those are real deal tip top pro lenses. They do have big price tags on them that scare a lot of folks. However, if you have one, if you're looking at one, yeah, they are awesome for bear photography. Just keep in mind they're really big and they can be clunky to, to carry around with you. We're talking about, you know, sometimes five to 10 pounds even with, with camera body. Okay, so that's the gear. So my tip top choice lenses. Let's, let's go around the world and eight bears and eight lessons. Okay, so the first up is the sloth bear. Blue from Jungle Book, um, predominant in India, but does cover some bases in India. We'll show a little bit of a range map here as well. So what could be the lesson with the sloth bear? Well, so this is the habitat that it lives in. It is real jungly, hence the Jungle Book. It is real scraggly. There's a lot of brush. There is a lot of distraction in this landscape. There are peacocks. My goodness, that's a distraction. Uh, but no, there's a lot of brush and there's a lot of, uh, it, it's difficult to shoot through the brush and through these distractions at times. 
um, you can see here, uh, you know, shooting through the canopy, shooting through this mid understory of the forest, just to photograph this this beautiful tiger. There's a lot going on. So how how to deal with photographing bears like this nice tufted ear sloth bear when you have a lot of brush? Okay. So the lesson here, um, a you know, shooting on those shallow F numbers are going to be your friend. That's a really, really great technique. So that 70 to 200 I was talking about, or just making sure you're the, the lowest F number possible. Switch to aperture priority mode. If you haven't yet become comfortable shooting on aperture priority, I highly recommend it because aperture is a big, big part of creative control. So minimizing that depth of field is going to be your friend. However, oftentimes with these big, big super telephotos, we don't have real small F numbers. So one way that I always recommend folks to do when maximizing blur is to think about the ratio. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a few slides here of examples of how you can really maximize blur regardless of your F number, regardless of that aperture setting, um, depending on the environment. So, okay, so what happens here is basically if you, the photographer, have a much greater distance between you and the foreground, and then the difference or distance between the foreground and then the bear is shallow, you're not gonna be able to separate that subject. It's gonna look really meshed together like in that previous photo. You're not, there's no difference in sharpness. Therefore, it's gonna look like it's all one scene. And it's not bad, you just, you would like to separate it somehow. So what I like to do and obviously when photographing bears and if you're in jeeps and safari trucks you know you, you don't always get to be exactly where you want to be but you want to look for these opportunities whether it's when the bear is moving and you can see a gap in the landscape or you can see that if you just move to this side of the vehicle and photograph this bear over here versus this over here then you have this really nice foreground that's very very close um, sometimes you can create that nice masking effect and, and what it does is when you focus on the bear, but then you have some foreground kind of framing it, is it blurs all that brush. So it's nice and, and blurred out. You don't notice it's a bunch of branches and a bunch of leaves. And that does help with composition. Now, uh, generally, uh, when we're talking about background, this looks like a foreboding photo right here. Bear is <laughs> approaching the photographer, but that's not the point. The point here is, is again, that ratio. Uh, I'm gonna toggle between the next photo or the next slide here this is what you want you want the bear closer to you than it is to the background then the background the ratio of the bear to the background to the photographer see what i'm saying here and this we're, we could be talking about dozens of feet hundreds of feet at times but it's that ratio if you can get that bear closer to you than it is the background that background is always going to be nicely blurred even if you can't get down to f4 and f2.8 so always keep an eye out for that. And you can see here in this example photo, all of a sudden now, if the background's a little more distant, then this, this sloth bear is getting a really nice bouquet or bokeh in the background. And that helps isolate the subject. It helps draw attention. It looks more professional. It actually increases what you perceive to be the sharpness of the photo because of the contrast with the background. Unblurred background, tack sharp focus on the subject, the subject looks even more in focus, okay? So that ratio is really the lesson I'm trying to tell you here. Uh, oftentimes when you're on foot, it makes it a lot easier, but nevertheless, scanning the horizon and seeing what opportunities you can make for yourself is really, really paramount. Okay, moving on to bear number two. The polar bear is circumpolar, found all around the Arctic in five countries and 19 different subpopulations. Uh, so, yeah, this is kind of a general range map. They are true denizens of the North Pole. They're found really quite all across the world, but there is a very big conservation story here. Um, so another uh, thing that we're not going to get into too much today, but is that conservation storytelling and the privilege that we have to photograph these amazing bears and what we can do with it afterwards. But the real lesson here is gonna be capturing that moment to then share it later. So how do you capture some of these rare behaviors and rare moments with wildlife? Polar bears, when we're talking about the Churchill area, the, the area that we go to, if you go back to this map, it's just in the bottom left, we're looking down in the world. Bottom left, you can see Western Hudson Bay population. Um, that's the one we're talking about. Bears congregate. It's one of the only places in the world where you're gonna see multiple polar bears, sometimes dozens of polar bears in the same area. 
And photographing bear interactions is a really, really awesome thing. So how to do it? Well, uh, my advice here is to, if you're on a point and shoot, you can do this very easily with two quick custom settings. One is get on the running man mode, which prioritizes for a very, very fast shutter speed. Uh, two is getting on photo burst mode, which prioritizes maximum frames per second. I mean, you can take as many photos as possible per every time you press that shutter button. Now, if you have a bigger fancier camera and you uh, don't want to set on these kind of automatic settings, you can go for a very, very fast shutter speed. And that's something that I always tell my groups when we're photographing bear interactions, you never know when just a casual walk around or sniff around of two bears can erupt in spar sparring or play fighting. So something like one over 1250 is a really, really good starting point. One over a thousand if you have to push it, but really nothing much slower than that. We're talking about really, really fast shutter speeds. And then paramount is make sure you're familiar with your drive motor. And that's what that second little icon is here. When you usually go into your drive motor of your camera's menu, it's gonna have like one square, two squares, or a lot of squares. And sometimes even the, the bigger, fancier cameras today will have a little H for high, high frame rate. And we're able to get like 10, 15, 20 photos a second. And it's absolutely amazing. It really is the difference between getting a photo that's pretty darn good and a photo that's absolutely exceptional. Because every moment that you're able to capture is a different expression. It's a different orientation of the faces and the heads and the fur and the landscape. So it's really important to get maximum frame rates for these quick bursts of bear photography. Uh, so getting the color and the tone of polar bears is another lesson. You kind of get two lessons here. Um, so sometimes we'll see polar bears on kind of cream colored rock and you notice real quickly how these translucent hairs can almost take the coloration of the environment. They're not a chameleon, they're not changing their color at all, but that relativity our eyes tend to see. Um, when they're on these cream colored rocks, they really do look quite cream colored, but when they're on snow, they look quite white. Now the lesson here is that if you are using your camera on anything but full, full manual mode, your camera's gonna make some decisions for you as far as the tonality and the amount of white or gray in the scene. And cameras meter to average on an 18% gray across your scene. You don't have to worry about these numbers, they won't be on the test later, but the idea is that if you're photographing a white animal on a white background, your camera is gonna make it artificially dark from what your eyes are actually seeing. So what we like to tell folks is when you're photographing bears on snow, not on rocks, but in these kind of scenarios, you actually want to overexpose your shot. It's kind of counterintuitive to what a lot of photographers would think if you're just starting out photographing polar bears. You might think, oh, I'm in this bright white Arctic scene. I need to, to dim my photo because it's, it's so much white that my eyes are seeing. It's the exact opposite. Your camera is compensating for that bright white. And you'll notice if you do nothing for your exposure compensation, you're gonna come home and most of your photos have a, a pretty strong gray tint to them. They're not the bright white, brilliant white. So the advice here is if you're going on a polar bear expedition or really photographing any animal where the color is really strong, either intensely white, intensely black, on that same color background, mountain gorillas come to mind uh, if you're going the other end of the spectrum, but anytime you're in these scenarios, especially with polar bears, you actually want to bump up your exposure in your exposure compensation by about maybe as much as plus one stops. This circle is a little bit extended. You probably don't want to go to plus two. That's going to be way too bright. But the trick is, is you want to start from the proper baseline. Now, I will always say, and I, I will, um, uh, I'm sure many of my photo guides will agree, is that you can compensate for this pretty well in Photoshop or Lightroom. And it is always better to photograph a scene a little bit too dark than a little bit too bright because it preserves that data. But nevertheless, you want to start at the proper baseline. So plus one third, plus two thirds, plus a full stop is a really, really great way to do it. This is one of these cases where you can absolutely do this on a point and shoot camera, that bridge camera on an iPhone. Overexposure is something you can do for just about every camera out there and something to keep in mind. But also remember that as you go from one shot to the next, if the bear is just walking through a patch of snow, but it's actually on darker gravel or red tundra the rest of the time, this rule does not apply. So you wanna be ready to change your camera back very, very quickly. Okay, 
So uh, we are now moving on to the black bear of North America. Range map here, it's found in a lot of places, okay? So this lesson here is going to be a technique for using less telephoto, like your 70 to 200 that I shot this photo with. See how there's this nice blur in the background, but also it kind of bridges over into this idea of wildlife in landscape photography. And it's something that I know, you know, every photo guide I talk with is, is we pretty much start our careers so hungry for that close up shot of the, the bear's face full in frame. And it's, it's just the head or it's just a big, powerful, meaningful photo. Um, but as we progress in our careers, we get more enamored actually with zooming out and showing the habitat, showing the landscape. And I think that's a really, really important lesson to convey uh, because you want to showcase where is the bear living? Where were you? Were you in a zoo? You can't tell if you just fill the frame. So this is why sometimes it's actually nice to not have that big telephoto and not be tempted to further and further push into the frame. It's so easy when you have your camera to look in the back and be judging what you want out of the photo out of a one inch screen. You say, oh, I want the bear's face. I'm going to zoom all the way in. Look, look at how nice that bear's face is. But when you put it on your 24, 27, 30 inch monitor, when you put it on a picture frame or on a TV, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I, I could have zoomed out a little bit more. So don't make that mistake and take some of your shots with that landscape zoomed out. Uh, it also helps with composition. So my technique here is if you're shooting with the 7200 or like a 24, 105, something that is generally wide angle, great technique for iPhone photography here is if you set your camera to a center point autofocus, you, you can get away with capturing behavior pretty quickly because if, if you're trying to recompose in the moment, it's very, very difficult to do with a moving bear. But if you're able to just put that center point autofocus in the dead middle of your frame, get the animal in the middle of your frame and snap the photo, you're able to capture behavior much better. Now, the problem with this is that it basically flies in the face of the rule of thirds. If you put that bear in the dead middle of your frame all the time, it's not how we like to take or not like how it's not how we like to portray photos at the very end. We like to offset it a little bit, which this photo actually is. But by taking it zoomed out, it gives you that room to crop in after the fact, which I did with this shot. You can see here the bear is offset in the two thirds of the frame. And then you have that nice open space that the bear is looking into in the right third of the frame. Um, I like to say I, I can't go a full photo presentation without having one rule of thirds grid. So here you go. Here's your here's your standard rule of thirds. But the lesson again here is if you overlay this tic-tac-toe board, either mentally or in your camera, you break your scene into thirds, you place prominent parts of your scene on the intersecting points, and you're going to have a much, much better photo. So if you have to photograph with that subject in the middle of your frame, make sure you zoom out a little bit so you can crop in and then readjust the, sh the shot afterwards. Okay, this next lesson I really, really like because this is a very common thing for all wildlife photographers is <laughs> photographing stuff when they're really far away. This is not a great photo. The, it's it's pixelated, it's, it's kind of blurry, it's sort of fuzzy. Um, and no offense to Brad, because he took this photo and he's one of the, the few people in the world that have any photos of moon bears because they're so rare, they're so far away, they're so difficult, um, but they're hard to get in you know, any sort of close proximity. But the thing is here, what, what to do when you know you're not going to get the shot, when the bear is a, you know, a mile away and you're like, I have, I have a 300 millimeter or 400 millimeter, the best thing I can do is you know get great composition like this great photo show the habitat it's actually really nice like if this thing were tack sharp focus it'd be a great shot but how do i document it at least capture something from the scene knowing it's not going to make the the cover of my album okay so this is what you do you kind of make lemonade of your shots that's what i like to call it okay so zoom in here here's the steps truly step one through five you zoom in all the way in your lens you use as much telephoto as you have and then pull back a little bit so if you have a 400 like go to what you would imagine to be like 390 the reason i say this is that that extra little 10 millimeters of focal length is not going to do anything for your overall quality or for your overall distance of your shot but it's going to make a very big difference to the quality of your shot you'd be surprised but 
um, especially less expensive or more intro lenses, they are sharpest or they are much sharper just a little bit in from their maximum length. Like all the way out, they get a little bit soft, but if you pull it in, it's a little bit sharper because we're trying to go for maximum sharpness and pixelation here because we're going to ultimately crop in a ton like this photo was. Uh, the next thing is you're going to prioritize a really, really low ISO. If you know you need to crop in your shot at like 100% resolution, a low ISO is paramount. So like getting down to 400, 200 is better, 100 is best. Then you got to get your shutter speed reasonable. The reason I say reasonable and not at a specific number is because you do need a balance between fast enough to freeze your hand movement and fast enough to give you that low ISO and it's a little bit subjective. If you're shooting at 500 millimeters, you, you want to be, even with the fanciest image stabilization, you want to be at, you know, 1 over 160, 1 over 100 at slowest. That's like with the steadiest of hands possible. If you have a tripod and the bear isn't moving, you can go slower. But really, 1 over 100, 1 over 160 is about the slowest I'm going to go. If you have trouble steadying your hands or if you're tired from a long day, you might need to go even faster, but that's kind of what I'm talking about is like get as slow as you feel comfortable with um, and then take a few shots, zoom in and see if you like it. Um, this, you know, obviously needs a patient bear. So hopefully you can do so. Um, another thing that's subjective is whether you can take those test shots and then plan on cropping in on your computer. Um, I should have showed you the original photo of this. Unfortunately, I, I don't have this. This is, this is not my shot. But usually what I'm talking about is like the original photo is, is yay big. And then the animal is this big in the scene, but you're cropping that much. That's why we have this lack of sharpness here. And then using post-processing tools, boosting the clarity, the sharpening, the tools at our disposal to try to rescue the shot, to, to make something of it when you just know it's either this or you don't get the shot. It's a pretty common thing in wildlife photography, to be honest. You know, we all wish we had a 2000 millimeter lens, but it's just, it's just not the case. Um, okay, Bornean sun bear. What are we talking about here? Well, this is a, a, an amazing bear that I spent a good bit of time with in my guiding to Borneo. I can't wait to head back to guide Borneo this coming June. I'm, I'm really excited about it to photograph these bears as well as all the other awesome stuff. Um, there, there is, there's a need to document these guys. There's a need to show photos to people uh, to get them to, to love them, to get them to save them. Um, they've had a pretty um, a difficult run with a lot of deforestation because they've had a pretty extraordinary historic range. But nevertheless, uh, just an amazing bear. And how, how can you deny this bear, these eyes, its proper home, its proper forest? Uh, if more people get to see them via photographs, I think we'd, we'd be doing better. Uh, but nevertheless, it's the world's smallest bear. We've got a superlative there. Um, and this, this is another great lesson that we could probably talk about with almost any other bear species as well as almost any other animal. Um, is depth of field issues when you need to use a bigger F number than normal. Another time that I'm going to uh, really challenge you, if you haven't yet learned aperture priority mode, try to get on that because you do need to have control over your aperture. Um, a great uh, photo buddy of mine uh, often says, you know, the key to wildlife photography, F11 and be there. Um, that's definitely the case in these kind of photos. Now, when we're talking about wildlife portraiture, a lot of people think, the opposite. It's like, well, why would I want to be on a big F number with a big depth of field? With close-up shots of just the animal, it's usually you want to isolate the subject. You know, everything I was talking about with the sloth bear, you want to be on a, a low F number, right? Well, here's the thing is it has to do with how close you are to the animal. So in the Sun Bear Conservation Center, we get very close to sun bears and with a 300 millimeter, we can really fill the frame. So I want you to look at a bear photo or an orangutan photo or really anything photo, heck, a raccoon photo, we'll go there. We'll go to their close cousins. And if you're filling the frame, you got to treat the animal as if it's a landscape shot. You got to treat this bear as if it's the, its head, its face is the mountain and its ear is the meadow and its nose is the wildflower in the foreground. You want it all in focus. So as a result, even though it's a small bear and you're, you know, it's, you know, it's a small bear, you would think that you're going to want to get a shallow depth of field. You need to get that wide depth of field so you're not getting only the nose in focus or only the eyes in focus and then the nose is completely blurred out or the ears are completely blurred out. You want to show that texture. You actually do need to bump it up and get a bigger F number. Um, now, 
bonus lesson here. If you haven't heard this from me before, it's going to be your saving grace for wildlife photography and people photography. Where do you focus in a scene like this? Where do you focus any time you photograph bears or people or creatures with eyes? You focus on the eyes. You, that, there's one part that's non-negotiable. I'm willing to take some blur in the nose. I'm willing to take some blur in the ears, but you have to fo uh, focus on the eyes. That's, that's always a, a really critical thing. Um, so the other thing here uh, is choosing a background. You get two bonus lessons here. Um, this is something I like to talk about here. And I don't know if you remember that uh, internet thing going around, like, I don't know, a couple months ago where there was a sun bear in a, uh, some sort of conservation center or something, and they thought it was a man in a bear suit. Seeing this photo again makes me think, yeah, that I can, I can see how people think that. It's a real skinny, small bear. It's in the tropics. So it doesn't need a lot of fat on it. doesn't need a lot of hair. Um, but I digress anyway. Um, choosing a background is something I say to all my photographers, and it's really, really helpful because, you know, what do you want behind that bear? We're not talking about whether it's in focus or not in focus. We're just talking about what do you want behind that bear? Do you want a bright spot? Do you want a certain color or a certain texture? As you can move and rotate, it's amazing how much better your bear photography will be. And again, even if you're confined to a vehicle or even if you can't move because your guide says, we got to stay here, we can't show motion or that bear will get scared off, sometimes you can move. Uh, you can move a foot this way and it makes a big difference. So notice how the background as I start to think and walk around this conservation center on the elevated boardwalk, what do I want my background? Do I want to be photographing down into the bear where the background is these interesting buttress roots? Not a bad photo, an interesting shot. Or do I want to look for those bears up in the canopy? Um, what's going on in the canopy? Are the, are the light, is the light really bright on the leaves? Can I find a spot that's a little bit darker? Um, you know, can I, can I get to an area where I'm not getting such bright highlights? Going back to that first lesson, I, I want to separate the background from my subject, right? Like, can I find leaves or a background that's more distant? I, I'm going to have to get leaves in the background. You know, we're in the Bornean jungle. We, we're going to get leaves. But what if I find an angle on this bear where the leaves aren't 15 feet behind the bear, but it's 150 feet, like this shot? Notice how as I pivot and rotate around this bear, I'm able to find a different background and I can ultimately choose my background. Notice how this background isn't quite as distant, so is it, it's not quite as blurred. Very, very different backgrounds as I move a little bit more blur here, right? So you can see how as, as we cycle through these photos, I'm, I'm choosing my background by paying attention to that distance, to even the colors, the textures, do I want a real nice spring green or do I like that rusty brown kind of orangish bark? How am I moving around? What's behind the bear? Because it makes, it makes a big difference. Okay, Andean spectacled bear in South America. So these are an exquisite bear um, and it's pretty darn rare to see these guys, even though they, are, they make extraordinary photographic subjects, they are confined to really high altitude Andean forests that look like this. Um, and it's a little bit difficult to see them and to spot them and to photograph them out in the wild. It's more than a little bit. So one option is to get into Digiscope, you know, with a smartphone adapter. You can do this with scopes as well. And I know uh, a colleague, Mike Hillman, a um, colleague of mine, Mike Hillman, has a great uh, daily dose recording on this exact technique. So I'm going to divert you there and, and, and do a little search if you can find it. Um, it's really cool, but I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, but what I am going to tell you is that there are, there are some really great conservation programs of Andean spectacled bears, and they're doing amazing work to rehabilitate and reintroduce these bears. It's really awesome stuff. Um, so as a result, sometimes our groups, we do see and have a chance to photograph these bears in enclosed structures. Now, these are big kind of natural habitat areas where there's, you know, plentiful um, perches and walking around rooms. So it's not, it's definitely not like a confined area, but I want to tell you and teach you in those cases where you do see wildlife behind glass, behind fences, what to do. So the trick is, is if you are in a scene where you are photographing through a fence or through some sort of barrier, um, again, Pretty simple, steps one, two, three. You wanna get as close to that fence as possible with your lens. Um, really, really close. 
Um, you obviously want to shoot through the fence as much as you can, but sometimes the fence is there. But what you're going to notice is if you get a shallow depth of field like F4 and you have that ratio where the fence is super close and the animal is, you know, think about that ratio. If you're here to here, mere inches, and the animal is, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet behind, that fence is going to be so blurred, you don't see it. I'm shooting through a fence right here. Um, great shot. You know, this this bear is munching on what I believe to be avocado, and I don't see any of that chain link fence in the foreground, which was just mere inches away from me. Um, so, yeah, really important lesson there. If you are photographing through glass, I don't have any example photos here, but if you're photographing through glass, it's important to still get as close as you possibly can. The technique there is if you have a lens hood on, which I usually advocate for using, take that lens hood off and get as close as you can to the glass as possible. They make these really interesting adapters these days where you can put it on the tip of the lens and it actually creates a dark orb around. You know, I don't think the folks, you know, you and the audience are going to be doing a lot of photographing through glass, but there are techniques we can maybe talk about at the end with, with Q&A if you're really interested in learning more. Um, okay, the panda bear, um, range and habitat. Uh, panda bear, what a great success story here. They, they recently were delisted from the endangered species uh, law because of their rehabilitation and their expanse in the wild. Uh, over 1,800 individuals now in growing, which is really, really awesome. We have a great trip to see pandas. We, of course, look for them in the wild, but oftentimes we're seeing them in these, these large, beautiful natural enclosures as well. And we, you know, the habitat here is, is really quite fascinating with this lush green verdant landscape and this bamboo, and we're getting waterfalls, and we have other animals in the area like this takin, and there's this incredible love for the panda in China. You can imagine it because there's, you know, pandas on every insignia and every logo, but it really is an extraordinary infatuation at these panda research centers, these panda bases, as they call it. And it's a great, great place to photograph them. It's a great place to look at all these lessons and think about the F number. Think about choosing your background, you know, as we rotate around these pandas as well. And you can see here, you know, as we get closer and closer, we're getting that F number, you know, higher and higher. I want the nose in focus. I want the eyes in focus. Um, so where are we going to focus? The eyes. This is a lesson, a little bit of a lesson about focus settings. So in your camera, you have a few different ways you can set focus. You can go on the top left here, which is going to be letting your camera decide, and it'll choose one of those, you know, 30 or so squares, which one is the best. The problem is, is oftentimes if you have vegetation in the way like you do with this shot, um, it's going to focus in the foreground and it's going to ignore that panda. Uh, you can hone in a little bit further and a little bit further, but I will say you picked this up from a previous lesson. My go-to is always dead middle of the frame. Always stick it there. That way you have complete control over what gets focused. Um, otherwise, you're letting the camera decide and you're going to get very, very frustrated. Um, so the reason this is important for this lesson is I love you know, adding a sense of wild, adding a sense of discovery to my photos. You know, we are on an expedition. We're on a wildlife discovery adventure right we're trying to find and observe wildlife so how do we do that well let's you know let's see if we can put an intrigue with putting some foreground let's let's make it look as if we're peering around a corner um you know we can kind of summarize a, a lot of lessons here with using the burst mode as well uh you can see this little uh juvenile panda cub waving to me wouldn't have captured this had i not put on burst mode here. So a really, really important thing for any sort of photography. A couple lessons here, integrating that framing, integrating a little bit of foreground element, making sure you have your focus settings properly so you can actually blur it out, meaning focusing on the panda, and then have that foreground blurred, and then burst mode for whatever antics that you might capture. Okay, uh, we're nearing, I, this might be one of our final bears here. Uh, so definitely get your questions submitted so we have some, some good solid time to answer questions about bear photography. The grizzly bear of North America, Europe, and Asia. This is a very cosmopolitan species. This is found in a lot of places, and there are so many lessons. Again, you can apply, uh, apply every photo lesson I've talked to so far to the grizzly bear or the brown bear, as we're seeing here, because these are the ones in coastal Alaska that feed on salmon. Um, so yeah, a couple things. 
uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about shutter speed, fast and slow. How to photograph bears in water. So this is at the famous Brooks Falls platform, something that we visit on each and every one of our uh, Ultimate Alaska Wildlife Safaris, one of our uh, most amazing Alaska trips, probably the most amazing Alaska trip out there of all travel companies. And there are a couple ways to photograph this. One way is the moment, capturing that individual moment, that precise, sharp, the salmon's leaping, the bear's going for it, everything's sharp. You can see the crystal clearness of every drop of water. And that's awesome. If you have a point and shoot camera, putting on the running man mode, if you're on a uh, bigger, fancier camera, you can shoot at something like, you know, one over 800, one over 1,000 shutter speed. You know, we're talking about very, very fast, right? Uh, but let's talk about slow uh, the other time. So I personally think this is the way to photograph these guys. I, I absolutely love this silky effect. You can get it by having the, um, the shutter speed quite slow. And when we say quite, we're looking at like a quarter of a second, a tenth of a second, um, half a second. For those of you with point and shoot cameras or with iPhones, you can put it on night mode and you can get the same shot. It's an absolutely amazing feature. If you're photographing running water with your, your smartphone, see if you can set it on the long exposure feature. It's something I love doing with my groups. It, it blows people away when we're on the edge of the falls and I say, hey, take that shot with your iPhone just as you see it. And I, you know, find the long exposure and, and get that photo to change from live mode to long exposure. And they see the silkiness of the waterfall and it's mind blowing. But again, if you have a bigger, fancier camera, you're going to want to get a slower shutter speed. It's really, really quite nice. And, it, you know, how slow is very subjective, but it has everything to do with the speed of the water, really. So because the water is absolutely rushing at Brooks Falls, you can get away with hand holding this like at one twentieth of a second, believe it or not. So one would think with the slow exposure, you have to have tripods. And unfortunately, uh, the platform of Brooks Falls usually does not allow tripods. But again, because of the speed of the water, you can handhold a shot at one twentieth of a second or one tenth of a second and get this silky waterfall effect. Now the kicker, the real challenging part is the bear has to be still as well right? So it's a lot of shots. It's a lot of trial and error. But if that bear moves in that tenth of a second, uh, it's going to, the, the bear is going to be blurry, right? So key thing to understand there. But it's not just at the platform itself. There are bears, uh, like bears that are bear camp in Lake Clark National Park that are in the river. And you don't have to be at a waterfall to get this really, really great silky effect. So, um, you know, here on contrast, we have a nice crisp effect, something like one eight hundredth of a second. Um, sports mode, this running man mode to get crisp focus, or go for night mode, go for one fifth of a second and get that nice silkiness of the water. Again, the bear can't be moving, but if you find a nice patient bear and you find some nice movement in the water, there has to be some sort of movement. There has to be some sort of white water to get the real dramatic effect. You can get some really, really neat shots. Um, so I want to, uh, as we're nearing the end here, I really want to hammer home this idea of animals and landscapes and brown bears and panda bears and, and all the bears are amazing to photograph in landscapes. Force yourself in your bear photography to take that telephoto off a few times and really get more of the habitat. We're, we're so tempted to zoom in as much as possible. And again, remember, we're, we're evaluating our success in the moment, in the back of our camera in a one inch screen you will probably never see that photo ever again in one inch format. It's always gonna be multiple times bigger. So think about what it's gonna look like after the fact, right? Um, you know, awesome, cute little bear cubs. And I'm just, I'm zooming in all the way. I'm like, oh, but I can't fill the frame, but it's kind of cute. And it's, it's an okay shot. I mean, I document it, it's fine, but what a better shot this is. I'm zooming out, I'm photographing the context. It's mama bear and her cubs. It's like, there's a nursery rhyme just waiting to happen about this. Um, and we're seeing the context, we're seeing the river, you know, is it perfectly composed? Is it going to make the cover of a magazine? I don't know, but I think it's a much better shot. Similarly, you know, these bears were so close to me. I could have got full frame face shots each and every time, but I chose to put on my ultra wide angle lens because I wanted to get a little bit of framing. I wanted to photograph a little bit of that. It was a, either spruce or a hemlock above those, those wispy kind of dangly things in the top of the frame. I wanted to get the leading lines of the grass shooting up from 
uh, below, kind of directing the eyes through the middle. And I wanted to have, you know, this, this three bears taking a bath. Um, you know, other shot was a nursery rhyme. This shot is some sort of joke uh, waiting to happen. I don't know what the punchline is. If you know of a good punchline of a, you know, three bears were sitting in a, in a lake taking a bath, please submit that in the comments and the questions. But nevertheless, it's such a, I treasure this photo so much more than uh, had I zoomed in all the way. And same thing with this. We oftentimes try to get people out of our shots. Um, I, on the other hand, always try to get people in my wildlife photos as much as possible. It is so much more memorable when I, when I show this photo and I say, I was there. It's so much more relatable when you can see this bear in the shoreline and you see these kayakers here in front of me. Sure, yeah, they were in front. And I would imagine that if you know your knee-jerk reaction is to say, oh my gosh, they floated right in front of me. I, I got the perfect shot use it, make lemonade. And I can tell you this lemonade tastes way, way better. So always try to get people in your shots as part of your portfolio. I understand that many of you in the audience don't have repeated times to, to get out there and take these shots. So you're, you're wanting that classic shot, but keep in mind some of the best ones may surprise you. Zooming out, keep on zoom out. Here we've got a, a really classic photo of the Kenai Range here we're at Brooks Falls, but it's not the classic Brooks Falls photo. Um, we're actually seeing a bear in the river with beautiful kind of shimmery light coming through, some fly fishermen in the distance. Uh, and what a, what a cool shot this is. It, I think this has an even bigger story to it than some of those real classic salmon jumping up and bears catching in the mouth shots. So always think differently. Go into a trip having done your research ab about the stories. I think one, a big storytelling element is to actually have a bit of the story ahead of time to understand wh what is going on in this area. Oh, it's it's a place where bears and people live peacefully. Go into it with that story. You can always invent a story at the moment in the scene. You can invent it afterwards. You can say, well, yeah, well, this is a photo. Oh, in the story, and it's a very accurate story, but if you go into it, your photographic eyes can be that more uh, acute and keen. So I always recommend doing a little bit of research and figuring out what what is the the quick little storyline of this area. And then when you photograph it, it's that much more overlapping with your intentions. Okay, awesome. We have near the end, remember get your questions submitted. I've, I've got some time to answer those and I'd be delighted to do so. Quick plug for the Natural Photographer, the photo tutorial website that I run with Natural Habitat Adventures. Um, you can see some recent posts here. Uh, we're talking about gorilla photo safaris and what's in my camera bag. We've got some shot settings for photographing glaciers and the right shutter speed to photograph sparring polar bears. Uh, and I also have about, I think I counted about 380 other articles I've written over the years. So definitely check that out. Great thing to bookmark as well, um, right at naturalphotographer.org. The other thing is our new photo expeditions page. Uh, if you go check this site out, feel free to bookmark it as well. You're gonna see the full listing of all of our photo adventures around the world. And if you're new to NatHab, this is a really, really great resource for getting inspiration, even if it's planning your own trips. Uh, but of course, we'd love to have you join us and I'd love to photograph alongside you in one of these uh, very bear-centric parts of the world. So thank you so much for joining today and I'd love to answer some questions. Court, thank you so much. Man, you packed in a lot of information there. I just want to remind everyone that they will get a replay link so they can watch this many times over and glean a lot of knowledge and wisdom uh, from what you have shared with us today. I might need to watch it a couple times. Um, we've got lots of questions, but I do want to remind everybody that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, if you only have one lens which is it mm, what a great question um i love that uh i'm keeping in theme with this webinar i'm gonna say the 100 to 500 um it's really versatile uh the fact that it goes all the way to 500 and as little as 100 is really really nice some of the other camera companies um have some very dreamy like 200 to 600s and i gotta say that getting to 100 is it's a landscape lens too. It's a people lens. It's a travel photography lens. So yeah, that'd be the one. I mean, of course it'd be tempting to say my walking around lens with a 24 or 105, but for wildlife photography, you gotta have that telephoto. 100 to 500, final answer. <laughs> How often do you have to resort to manual focus in a brushy situation? 
Fortunately, not very often. Fortunately, not very often. Um, I the the real trick there is spend some time at home getting your autofocus point to the smallest pinpoint it possibly can. Sometimes on cameras, it'll get to like a square. If you're seeing my webcam here, um, a square like this big of the frame. And then weirdly, somewhere else in the menu system, you, you can click on something that says enable smaller autofocus point. And then all of a sudden, another one will appear that's like this big. And then that accuracy makes a big difference. Um, yeah, honestly, if, if I'm having to resort to manual focus, in brushy environments, it probably means that there is almost no wildlife contiguously visible through the brush. And I'm not sure if it's gonna be a great photo at all. You know, like I, I do need to have some little window that I can crop in and fill fill the frame or not fill the frame, but you know, to, to really showcase. Um, so fortunately I haven't had to do that, but yeah, it, it's, it's possible, um, but that's where the bigger, the better cameras are going to have smaller autofocus points and better accuracy. I'll tell you one, one other trick with autofocus in challenging scenarios is your camera's autofocus is almost entirely reliant on contrast, meaning if there's, let's say, a black bear in the brush and you're trying to photograph it and like its ear is black and its hair is black and its nose is black, instead try to focus on the margin of its hair meaning like if the background is is a slightly different color let's say green try to focus where half of your autofocus box is black and then half of it's green you still want to aim for somewhere around the eye because it does make a difference even in brushy scenarios but autofocus relies on contrast so hopefully that that empowers you a little bit more going forward okay um can you remind us what your preferred focus region is? Was it single uh, point? Single point dead middle. And so the thing is, is that is going to force you for pretty much all of your wildlife shots, if you wish to get it exactly right in camera, meaning you're not going to crop or edit, which, you know, cropping and editing is great. But like, if you want to get it exactly right in camera, that means center point autofocus, you get the animal in the dead middle of your frame, and you hold the shutter down halfway or the autofocus button in the back, and then you um, you lock it in, and then you need to recompose your shot and then depress the shutter all the way. So that way you want the animal slightly off center to adhere to the rule of thirds. Um, but yeah, slight, basically that way you're getting the shot in camera. Now, remember with the black bear technique, if you need to shoot instantaneously, you don't, you don't have that time to recompose then just zoom out a little bit and that way get it in the dead middle of your frame. So it's smack dab in the middle and then crop in, bring the sides in and offset it afterwards. Um, now we could have a whole different webinar on new mirrorless technologies of autofocus tracking. Um, it's probably honestly the minority of you in the audience that have cameras that, you know, have that capability. Um, I shouldn't, I, you know, I, I honestly don't know, but it's it's a newer technology. It's quite advanced. It's awesome. If you know about it, if you use it, and if you have questions about it, you're, you're probably familiar enough to use it. That's fantastic too. Um, but I've, I've still found that most of the time, if I want to be really, really good, and I want tack sharp, focus on exactly what I want, I do that center point autofocus, lock in, and then recompose. Okay, excellent. Um, on the polar bear exposure, can the gray situation be corrected in post if shooting in raw? It totally can. It totally can. So shooting in raw is going to give you much more editable capability. So yeah, you, you definitely can. And it's, it's not, um, you know, you could shoot it even and do just fine. However, I promise you, if you're photographing white bears and white snow, you absolutely will be overexposing it. So starting from the baseline will just give you more editable ability, really, because, you know, even just that upper, you know, positive one third, positive two thirds increment gives you a better starting point. But yeah, if you're if you're a little bit scared of adjusting that, then it's it really is quite all right to shoot on even. But um, trying that out will give you a better shot in camera for sure. And it gives you more room to edit with. OK. Um, a couple more questions about mirrorless cameras. Um, can you reiterate some of the advantages and possibly recommend a reliable 
um, moderately priced one. Yes. Okay. So the advantages are um, generally smaller and lighter. Some of these lenses that I have with Canon are breaking that mold and they're bigger and heavier, but generally smaller and lighter. It's funny, the little, are you guys seeing that thumbs up thing that's happening when I'm counting on my Mac webcam these days? It's funny. Um, smaller and lighter, faster autofocus speeds, um, generally newer, so therefore better sensors, um, in-camera image stabilization, which was usually not a feature with DSLRs. Um, in camera means that you have image stabilization in the, the body itself. So then when you get an image stabilized lens, you're like adding stabilization on stabilization and getting super stabilized. So like my bigger, fancier lens by the, the books are giving me like eight stops of image stabilization. It doesn't actually play out that much, but it's really, really good for handholding situations. And then probably the the two biggest things for me is that tracking autofocus. DSLRs were kind of getting into this when they allowed live mode, but it has everything to do with how the camera is perceiving the image and whether the mirror is in the way. But when the camera is actually perceiving the image in real time continuously, you can do some really awesome things with autofocus. And it's pretty game changing for wildlife photography. If I do like a birds in flight photography webinar at some point, like I can like a total ignoramus, just close my eyes, have it on this setting, push the button as the bird's flying overhead, and I'll get the bird in tack sharp focus each and every time where you can see every wing feather and I'm doing nothing. It's that awesome and that easy. So it's a, it's a big game changer for autofocus. Um, there's a recommendation, you know, that's where it's, it's a little bit tough. Um, I shoot on the Canon R5. It's, a, it's an expensive camera um, relatively and you got to buy lenses, but I am a Canon person. Um, I think there are lineup, like a crop frame R10 or R7 is going to run you, I'm guessing like $1,000 or $1,500, something like that. You got to buy the lenses on top of it. But if you really want some, um, you know, hands-on help, just shoot us an email. Just say, you know, Court said he'd, he'd help me with this and they'll they'll ping me an email and I'll personally help you with some some camera recommendations based on your budget, your experience, all that sort of stuff. All right. One last question. Um, do any of the Nat Hab trips have opportunities to see moon bears and sloth bears? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these, these are all from Nat Hab trips for sure. So our Grand India Wildlife Adventure um, is pretty darn good for sloth bears, as is our tiger quest. Um, yeah, we're after tigers, but it's the same habitat. And I got to say, like, yeah, tigers and sloth bears, they hang out in the same area. So both of our India trips have a uh, pretty darn good chance. The longer the time you're there, the higher the chance. So, you know, Grand India is like 12 days and Tiger Quest is eight days. Um, then, yeah, for moon bears, our China trip. Yeah, I, mean, I don't, I mean, we're not seeing them every trip, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, I, they, they, are, they are seen, they are seen. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's the last question we have time for today. So I will hand it back to you for closing comments. Well, thanks, Sonny. And thanks everyone in the audience. Uh, it's always fun to be back on here. I shared a lot of tips. I know I went very fast today, but you can always uh, replay it and yeah, slow it down on YouTube to like half speed and <laughs> watch me be very lethargic like a sloth bear, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's fun to talk about this stuff. These are all uh, tried and true lessons for wildlife photography but especially for bears and maybe photograph bears with you in some far flung corner of the planet. It'd be great. Court, thanks again for taking the time to present to us today. Um, I also wanna thank everybody who tuned in and who presented such great questions. Please join us again next week for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone.